is called uh, Thoma Standards, uh, Introduction to Building Measurement. Uh, it's being uh, brought to you today by uh, Nate Olson, who's the uh, founder and owner of Contour. So please welcome Nate. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I might ask, anyone have experience with BOMA? BOMA standards? Any kind of measurement standard? Square foot of sun, okay. What kind of measurement standards? Well, if you find you have IBD, yeah. Oh, what's that? I said standard, but you have IBD at your Okay, okay, same? Okay, great. Um, Okay, so like John said, my name is Nate Olson, founder and CEO of Contoured. Um, I've been a member of the BOMA uh, International Floor Measurement Standards for more than 12 years. Um, uh, served as an official interpreter for their standards for probably four or five years till they discontinued that program. Um, I'm a contributing author to all of their current measurement standards and was the vice chair of our retail standard, which was just published uh, at the end of last year. I was also a consultant for the International Property Measurement Stand Coalition, it was about 10 years ago, for office and industrial properties, ULI, and uh, et cetera. Um, our mission at Contoured is really to facilitate trust and confidence between the AEC and commercial real estate CRE communities. And um, what we do at Contoured is we probably scan between 20 and 50 buildings a month all over the country. We do all kinds of square footage analysis. We do scan to BIM, scan to CAD, um, and then lots of, lots of area analysis, lots of measurement. So I, I'm gonna do a really high level overview of measurement standards, specifically calculating square feet or square meters um, and how we use those. And then if you wanna get into the weeds specifically about a specific measurement standard, we can. Um, so I just want to, the first thing I want to do is just look at the dictionary. So Merriam-Webster, a standard is something set up and established by authority as a rule for the measure of a quantity. So in this case, our authority would be BOMA. There's other authorities, Real Estate Board of New York, International Property Measurement Coalition, municipal, uh, municipalities, so cities, States, you know, for um, construction and such, they'll have their FAR calculations. Uh, the rule is a prescribed procedure. So whenever we do any kind of measurement, we follow a specific procedure. And we'll, we'll get into that in a second. And then, of course, we're measuring square footage. BOMA. So BOMA is the Building Owner Manager Association. It's an international group. It's made up of a coalition of local chapters. There's about 50 in the United States. And then they have some big um, uh, supporters actually in South Africa, Australia, Russia, Canada, Mexico, are the, the other countries that really support BOMA. It was founded in 1907, and it probably is the leading trade association for building owners and operators. Um, and they published their first building measurement standard in 1915, which was an office standard. Um, currently, um, there are six standards, and these are by year that they were most recently affirmed. So mixed-use properties was actually just approved by ANSI within the last three weeks. The retail standard at the end of last year, industrial, gross, office, uh, the multi-unit residential is under development right now, as well as the office, they're being reaffirmed. And there is a life science standard that's going to probably become an appendage to the office and or industrial standard. So I think the committee voted to not do its own standalone standard, but it will be incorporated into office or industrial. So what measurement standard should I use? BOMA or otherwise, which begs another question is, what's the purpose for measurement? Why are we measuring uh, the property? 
So here, here are some examples of why and when somebody might want to employ one of the measurement standards. So buying or selling a building, appraisal, possibly it's getting refinanced, underwriting, feasibility, CAM calculations, there's a significant amount of leasing coming up in a property, sometimes they need it for marketing, square footage disputes are common, operating agreement, entitlements, new construction, remodel, construction costing. So in fact, John helped us with, it's probably been a while now, they scanned, we did um, an operating agreement for the Watergate in Washington, D.C. John scanned the buildings and we did all the calculations um, for seven different owners of about five different buildings and they shared a central plant. So there was another reason for measurement. Uh, what tools do we use to perform measurements? So typically a floor plan or a model and the applications we generally use are AutoCAD or Revit. There are other applications um, that you can use as well. There are some challenges with Revit, but um, if you really want to do it, you can, it's possible. Um, what kind of drawings do we use? This is just a little uh, a diagram of a life cycle of construction documents from start to finish. So on the left hand, we have programming. When they get into the drawings, are mostly at that time blocking drawings, then into schematic design or SD. A lot of times it'll be SD1 or SD2 and so forth. Design development documents, the cores, the curtain walls get more developed. Onto construction documents, which is typically a, a full set uh, used to build the building. And the building's constructed. Um, the proper term for a red line construction document would be as built. However, the industry and our industry often refers to an as-built as a existing conditions document. Um, AIA recently had a YouTube video about all of those types of documents their attorneys were on. It's an interesting discussion. Um, I geek out on that kind of stuff. You know, what, what's the difference between construction documents, existing conditions, and as-builts? Um, for their contracts, obviously, they have to get into the weeds a little bit as to what those drawings mean. Um, we hear this question a lot. Has the building been measured per the BOMA standard? And I, I like to rephrase that as we refer back to our definition of standards is, has the BOMA process or guide been followed and documented? So that's a lot of times we'll get just the number or we'll get just the floor plan. And they want to know if those were Bowman numbers. So I'm going to go through a little bit about um, how we measure. And this will set a really good foundation for how the Bowman standards work. So every building, regardless of standard, follows the exact same four or five step procedure when we measure. Step one is we measure the building perimeter. In the BOMA office standard, there are actually 11 different types of boundary conditions that we come across when we measure perimeters. Um, the most prevalent condition is what they call dominant portion. So when we measure a perimeter of an office building, we measure to the inside face of the dominant portion of the wall. So it could be glass, could be the wall itself, could be brick, could be block. But the perimeter of a building, there's, there's about six or seven different places to where we can measure the perimeter. So if you think of this room here, I can measure where the carpet hits the wall, inside face of where the, the wall is. I can measure to, we have a column there. Is the column ignored or do we go around it? Um, what if there's a glass, uh, a window? Do we measure the window? So you can measure to the inside face of glass. Uh, Heinz, one of the biggest merchant developers in uh, the United States, measures to the inside face of the outside pane of glass in a dual pane window system. So they pick up that extra gap in the glass. And you wonder why we measured Salesforce Tower for them in San Francisco, and the difference between the inside face of glass and the outside face of glass was 2,600 feet. And that building today would trade for well over $1,000 a foot. So it's millions of dollars just by changing how they measured 
the perimeter. You can measure to the outside face of the exterior enclosure, you can measure to the outside face of emollient, outside face of glass, and in industrial, a lot of times we'll measure to the drip line of the roof. So even if there's an overhang and the drip comes out beyond the exterior face of the building, a lot of times we'll measure to that drip. This is just an example of a floor plan, uh, the perimeter, and it's kind of a dark line, I'll throw it on top of there. Um, but here's what our measurement line ends up looking like. Put the, put the perimeter back in. Step two. So step one was the perimeter. Step two is we actually go through and inventory all the rooms. They get classified and categorized. So um, here's that same floor plan. We've added uh, the core and other interior build out. Here we go ahead and classify. Every single room gets a number, a name, and then it gets categorized into what we call area classification. And these area classification categories are defined by the standard. So the BOMA office standard has major vertical penetrations, parking, tenant, building amenity, building service, and floor service. Each standard for BOMA has different categories. The industrial is different than the retail, uh, versus the multi-unit residential. So they're all different types of categories. Step three is then we actually go and measure those rooms. Um, and this is an important step um, because we follow what is called wall priority. So when we measure a room, for example, a stairwell, is the wall that encloses the stairwell a part of the stair or is it a part of the room adjacent? So BOMA has what they call wall priority, and they set a priority to which room gets measured first. And for the office standard, it happens to be major vertical penetrations. So major vertical penetrations will always include their enclosing wall. So when we measure a stair, it includes the wall. When you measure an elevator, it includes the wall. Um, and then I'll show you some examples. So here's what it looks like when we apply uh, wall priority to area classification. There's an example of um, a stair, and I want to look at this one because we've zoomed in here a little bit. Now, if you if you look at the green, the red represents major vertical penetrations. So, if we look at the stair or the elevator D13 on the left, you'll notice it's including all of its enclosing walls. When it's up against the green area, which is called building service, building service is the second priority. So that's why in the yellow is floor service. It's third priority. So you'll notice that when you have yellow next to green, green wins. Red wins overall. Blue is tenant area, which is always last. So tenant area is gonna always not include its enclosing wall. Now, if you look at D14, you'll see the stair, and it appears that the, the stair has stopped and the green is winning right to the left of D14. You see what I'm talking about? So one of the caveats of BOMA is that we don't know what's in the wall, right? Unless we had a set of original construction drawings. But if we're scanning this building, a lot of times all we know is what's on the outside face. So sometimes we will follow what the typical wall thickness will be required for fire safety. So if it's an eight inch, six inch, eight, whatever the wall is for fire safety, that will be what's required um, for us in measurement. So that's why you see the mail room looks like it's enclosing the wall, or including the wall up against the red. It is including part of the wall because we're assuming that it was furred out. So it was furred out beyond the firewall for the stairwell. Does that make sense? Okay. This is a diagram, it's hard to see, uh, we produced to show all the different types, not all of them, but a number of different types of conditions that exist on a floor plan and how we measure them. So door setbacks, um, unenclosed areas, how we handle some columns. Um, this is just a, a, a diagram that you can reference after I leave if, if, if you wanted to. 
Okay, step four is we take into consideration special conditions. So in the office standard itself for BOMA, there's 19 special conditions that we consider uh, in a building. Doesn't always exist, sometimes there's zero, sometimes there's all 19. So we always look at those special conditions. This is an example of columns up against the perimeter, and the other one is an unenclosed uh, building feature. So in the last couple of years, probably one of the biggest things facing the standards is BOMA has never traditionally included unenclosed space. Balconies, decks, roof terraces, colonnades. If it's not fully enclosed, typically BOMA would not account for that space. Um, times have changed. Construction practices where I'm at in California is all they want to do is provide outdoor amenity area. They're finishing all the roofs, their terraces, balconies, even um, plazas um, are getting finished and they're pouring tons of TI money into finishing those areas. So in the, in the up and coming standards as we revise them, we're gonna start to see in the latest, especially in the retail standard, we now actually account for every area that's included in what we call the retail experience. So you think about, uh, and that's a little nebulous. So, but it, but it does, we measure the area to where the minute you cross a line, maybe it's a change in flooring, it's a change in ambiance, it's a change in something to where that retail experience occurs, we start to measure those areas. Uh, whereas in the past, BOMA, if there's no roof, it's, it's not in the standard. Um, doesn't mean that that area is leasable, but it does mean that we're now starting to quantify it. Step five is we now do the math. So the BOMA office and industrial standards take common areas or service areas and apportion them back to the occupants on a prorated basis. So the retail standard doesn't do this for leasing purposes. It does it as an advanced concept for calculating CAM fees, but the um, office industrial will do it and it's, and it's charged back to the tenant in what is called a load factor. So if you've heard that term load factor or add-on factor or loss factor, um, loss is a little bit different, but, but uh, load factor is the apportionment of service area back to tenant area. So in every BOMA standard, there is a spreadsheet, and it shows you how to do those calculations. Um, it's called a global summary of areas, and they'll show you the formulas necessary to perform the allocation of service area back to tenant or occupant space. Okay, in review. Step one, we measure the boundary. We kind of build up this process. Step two, we classify all of the different areas and categorize them per the prescribed method of the BOMA standard. So in this case, you'll see there's tenant area, building amenity, building service, floor service, major vertical penetrations. Step four is, remember, we apply any special conditions. Um, and then uh, step five is we do some math. And you can see here in the office standard, occupant area is the combination of tenant and tenant ancillary. Floor usable is the combination of amenity and tenant area, and then floor rentable or rentable area includes the service areas. But keep in mind those service areas get apportioned on a prorated basis back to the tenant area. And then major vertical penetrations are an exclusion. So they're deducted uh, as non-rentable or non-leasable area. So, Measuring uh, major vertical penetration in a building is very important. Uh, shafts, elevators, you know, vertical um, circulation, um, because it affects the overall rentable area of the building. So that's one of the things that we look at when we're anal analyzing other people's measurements, is how do they measure the penetrations? Because that's the, the, one of the biggest things that, that's gonna affect the rentable number, and then obviously the perimeter. So we always want to look at the, the perimeter and the penetrations to get the overall number for rentable. 
when we start to break it down to the individual tenants, then we need to do the prorated calcs for the service areas. Ten minutes. <laughs> okay. Um, every BOMA standard gets ANSI certification. So ANSI is the American National Standards Institute. It's a voluntary consensus that's subject to their oversight. So whenever we finish a new standard, we submit it to ANSI, and they go through a canvassing process where they reach out to supposed parties that would be involved in using the standard. Not just building owners and managers, brokers, tenants, occupiers. Any party that might have an interest in the standard has the opportunity to comment um, positively or negatively about the standard. ANSI then gets back to us at BOMA and says, here's all the comments that we had during your canvassing and during your survey, and sometimes we have to make changes. Sometimes they're minor, sometimes they're major. Um, but at the end of it, we then get ANSI approval, and we get assigned a number, and, and BOMA assigns, like the office standard, uh, their approval number is ANSI slash BOMA Z65.1 dash 2017 for the 2017 standard. That's important because that line shows up in a lease a lot. So they'll say this building or your space was calculated per ANSI BOMA Z65-1 2017 um, or 2010, which was the last revision. And a lot of older leases we'll see will say Z65.1-1996, which was the 96 office standard. Uh, you know, why ANSI? I think it adds credibility to the standards. It says that we got, got a consensus of all the parties. So BOMA is really big. It does cost us a lot of money to get the ANSI uh, certifications, um, but definitely well worth it for credibility. Um, okay, IPMS. So about 10 years ago, um, a coalition was formed of about 50 countries and they wanted to create a, a measurement standard, um, and it was called the International Property, Property Measurement Coalition. And they brought professionals from all these different countries, all these different kinds of measurement standards, and tried to create one standard. Well, it's been 10 years now, and I think they count, I was on a call this morning, 25,000 hours to create the standard that's gonna get published here within the next couple of weeks. Um, IPMS was, was really built for transparency. Um, you'll see in my next slide some of the different measurement standards that are used throughout the world. But IPMS could create a single standard by which you could compare a building in New York to a building in London, or Tokyo, or Hong Kong. So that if you had somebody like JP Morgan or you know, a big institutional investor who wanted to own real estate in multiple countries, they would use this standard so that you could compare building to building. Currently for leasing in New York City, uh, Redney, the Real Estate Board of New York, their measurement standard is the predominant standard used, which is much different from BOMA. Um, BOMA standard is most popular in the rest of the United States, Canada, Mexico, um, Australia, Russia, South Africa, some countries in Europe. Um, the rest of Europe and the UK used an older standard from RACS, which was the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors, or RICS. Um, they were one of the biggest advocates of IPMS, and they in turn dumped their standard of 100 years in favor of IPMS. So now all of the UK, I'd say most of uh, Western Europe uses the IPMS measurement standards. Um, this was a, a diagram that IPMS published. Hong Kong is represented by red. That was the leasable area of an office floor in Hong Kong. And as you come up, there's different. Purple was BOMA, um, blue is Singapore, green is PCA, and yellow is RICS. So as you can imagine, if I'm buying a building in New York, and New York's closer to the red, that building, let's say, is a million feet measured in red. 
you, and you go to take that exact same building, pick it up, take it to the UK, set it down, it's now 24% smaller, just based on their measurement standard. So this is one of the reasons why IPMS wanted to create a standardized method by which you could compare buildings all over the world. It's also used, it's a very simple standard. It doesn't do any apportionments um, of common or service areas. So it's used by a lot of developing nations too as their municipal standard as they start to do entitlements and that type of thing. Um, one of the biggest challenges with BOMA as this is um, the three office standards, 96, 2010, and 2017. All of these line items as you go across horizontally are the same terms. So it's become a challenge not just to know one standard, but to know the difference between older standards up until today. So for example, in 2017, our boundary or perimeter measurement is called a boundary area. In 2010, it was called IGA. And in 96, it was called gross measured area. And in fact, BOMA right now has almost 10 different definitions of gross area. So, I mean, and, and, and just knowing, you mean you have gross measure, gross construction, interior gross, exterior gross, construction gross. Um, there's a net gross in the, in the, in the residential, the multi-unit residential. So these are all very similar terms, but over time, it does become a challenge to stay on top of the difference in these terms, especially when we start to see them in leases and we see lease disputes and that type of thing. Uh, one of the most common terms, usable, is no longer a term in the current BOMA office standard. So they now use tenant area or occupant area, and the industry has hung on to usable. So we still hear it all the time as an industry term, however, it does not equate back to any type of definition in the current BOMA standards. They've even added advanced terms. So we have inner building areas. So inner building areas are used when we have a campus of buildings. So I might have a central plant that is gonna get allocated to multiple buildings. So we have um, all different ways to do those calculations in the BOMA standard. Um, occupant storage, ancillary spaces, um, and different types of load factors. We create a matrix, because <laughs> you, you pretty much have to and, and it's hard to see, it's a little blurry, but at the top are all the different types of boundary areas. So I mentioned, you know, outside face of exterior enclosure, dominant portion, drip line, etc. All those different standards at the top measure the perimeter differently. And then we put all the different types of areas and we classify those if they're measured, are they rentable, are they in, are they out? And so a lot of times we will provide this matrix to our clients for a better understanding. Um, any questions? Anybody have any questions? I'm just curious, Nate. Um, you know, on the different standards, you know, do you see uh, eventually uh, BOMA being replaced by IPMS? Yeah, so that's a great question. So when IPMS was formed, uh, Lisa Pratt, who was the liaison for BOMA International, had to sign a document that we would incorporate IPMS into the BOMA standards. So in the global summary, you will see columns in the BOMA standard that are equal to certain measurements in IPMS. IPMS did an interesting thing. Rather than, rather than call the space rentable or gross, um, they used numbers. And so you have IPMS one, two, and three. And so when you're calculating tenant area, in IPMS, it's IPMS 3, okay? And if you're calculating um, aggregate, like a gross area, construction gross, it's, it's IPMS 1. And so inside the BOMA standard, you'll see in the spreadsheet, certain columns are equal to IPMS 1, 2, or 3. Now, IPMS does not apportion service areas. So, office owners are always wanting to maximize their square footage, right? They want to get as much as they can. IPMS doesn't really allow that. So, at least in North America, I, I don't see us 
unless IPMS adopts an apportionment, but then they start competing with BOMA. And the way when BOMA went into it, they're like, okay, we'll be on this thing, but we're gonna hold on to apportionment, and we'll support this, and we'll show how to do it in ours, but we wanna keep this set. So, it was, uh, in early days, it was pretty intense. That's what I bet it was. <laughs> yeah, I think we're at time. Um, if, uh, if you want to see the slide deck, you can scan the QR code. It just goes to our website, and uh, it's there. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Nate. Very good.